Welcome back to part two of The Guilty Feminist. So plug in and get ready for the fun. Hello, Hammersmith Apollo! Are you ready for the second half of The Guilty Feminist? Then please, welcome back to the stage, Deborah Francis White! Hello, hello, hello. Do you have a wonderful in did you meet anybody and make any feminist plans? Has anyone bumped into anyone they, they didn't know was going to be here, but they were like, oh my God. Yes, you did. Did you bump into, who did you bump into? So Alice, she bumped into Alice. She's awesome. She's writing a play about the first female doctor, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, do you mean? Yeah, I'm a big... The things that she had to do... Yeah. She, first of all, had to apply to all these different medical schools, but they all said, no, men only. It says on the website. And there was only one that hadn't put that on the website because they thought it's just like saying, zebras not need apply. Like, obviously, it's men only. But that was the loophole, and she passed the test with flying colours. They had to let her in. But then she wasn't able to get a full medical license until she found out in the Sorbonne in Paris they were training doctors and uh, for, who were women as well. Sorry, that's implied to me. If I say doctors, I mean women. Um, <laughs> and uh, so she had to speak French well enough. So she had to imagine learning French well enough to get a medical degree in it. Imagine wanting anything that much. I can't even imagine. And then she came back, no one would employ her, so she had to start for her own clinic. No one would go to it, not even women. And then she had a lucky break, outbreak of cholera. <laughs> Turned it around for her. The reason she's a feminist is not she did those things. She could have been a remarkable woman. She's a feminist because she then opened up a medical school for women, which is part of UCL even to this day. That's why she's a feminist. Are we ready to start the first act in style? The second act in style? I, I love this comedian so much. She has the uh, uh, I mean, extraordinary title of being the first woman in this country to have her own late night satirical show. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you, you will know it as Late Night Mash. And tonight she's coming back to the Guilty Feminist for the seventh birthday party. Put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises. Break laws if necessary to welcome Rachel Paris! Hello! Hello everyone, what a treat it is to be here. Are you all right? So glad to hear that, that's excellent. Um, I wanted to talk to you uh, a little bit about Kids, um, I had a kid last year. Give me a cheer if you've got a kid. I've also got stepkids. Has anyone got stepkids? I called them my stepkids. Because blended families are fantastic. You know, families aren't now the sort of perfect nuclear family that Georgia Maloney wants everyone to have. Um, you know, uh, they're complicated and they're interesting and they're better. And uh, my stepkids, and I called them my stepkids straight away, like as soon as I moved in with their dad. Like I didn't wait for the marriage to fall. I called them my stepkids straight away um, because people get really weirded out when you refer to the children that live in my house. <laughs> very creepy. Or when people are like, oh, how's your love life going? And you're like, oh, it's going well. I've moved in with a 16-year-old boy. And you're like, no, no, he's my stepson and my weed dealer. <laughs> he's not. He's not. He won't give me any. Uh, he says that I weaken the brand. You know, you guys know better than anyone, like, there are, there are so many myths about stepmothers, you know, uh, the, from the grim fairy tales um, through to, like, the Disney franchise, the wicked stepmother and the cruel stepmother and the evil stepmother. And I, you know, I've looked at them and I've thought about how to tackle that. Uh, and the way that I deal with those misogynistic stereotypes uh, is just to lean into it. <laughs> That's what I've decided to do. So, you know, I wear a lot of capes. Um, very heavy on the eyeshadow these days. And both of the kids know if we see a tower, 
they are getting locked in it. Um, you know, you have to just lean into these things. Uh, my stepdaughter is beautiful. She was 13 when we got together. Uh, and get this. She was already, at the age of 13, better at makeup than I am in my late... And I resent that. Uh, I feel like that generation, Gen Z, they've grown up with, like, Zoella and YouTube videos showing them how to do flawless, perfect makeup. Uh, and even the goals that we're looking for there have changed. Like, when I was 13, I wanted to look pretty. And I'm pretty sure that they want to look blurred. I think so. I think that's right. I think that's right. So, like, even the compliments I used to give to her would be, like, instead of saying, oh, you look pretty, I would say, uh, I can't see the edge of your face. I don't know where your nose ends and your cheek begins. And she'd be like, oh, thank you. you know, so it does work. But I find it sort of sad that there's, there's a generation of young people walking around on the streets, even now, with the correct amount of foundation on their face. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. At the age of 13, your foundation should be caked onto your face with a spork. You should be able to, like, lift it off in pieces. And colour-wise, if you've got pale skin, it should be a burnt orange. And if you've got dark skin, it should be the colour of the moon. You know, at the age of 13, your mascara should be passed down from your mum who decided that after nine good years, it deserved a new life. Yeah? So it's roughly the consistency of blue tack. You have to press it on like that. Your eyeliner should be a dry coal scraped across the eye or a sort of really mad uh, liquid eyeliner like a drunk Mondrian. Absolutely crazy. Your lipstick should be a frosted pink from an aunt or... I'll take you back to 1999. I don't know if any of you are this age exactly. You have to be right the same age as me. 1999, the trend for lipstick. Concealer on the lips. Yes! Concealer on the lips with a clear gloss on the top. What were we up to? What was the message here? The message was, no, 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 no. There's no mouth here. But rest assured, the area is wet. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> eyebrow. We have like these days. They they fluff their eyebrows and accentuate them and make them darker and laminate them. And in the nineties, we had a much simpler attitude to eyebrows, which was get rid, <laughs> get those bastards off my face. As a geriatric millennial, for such as I am, I will never not be ashamed of having eyebrows. And I'm afraid Generation Z's attitude to their own eyebrows is arrogant. That's, that's just how I feel. Um, I'm aware I will have lost some of you who don't wear makeup, sorry. Um, but in case any of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about, quick glossary. Um, Foundation, uh, where do we start? With mascara is the, the dark stuff you put on your eyelashes um, to make them thicker. Lipstick you're probably okay with. Concealer is like flesh colour stuff to cover spots and, and under eye. Foundation is the liquid that makes you human colour. <laughs> so, uh, a few blank faces still. So if you've ever walked into work and gone to a colleague, oh, hi Jan, you look well. She's wearing foundation. <laughs> and that's all it is. And equally, if you've ever walked into work and you've gone, oh, hi, Jan. You're right, Jan, you look a bit tired. <laughs> She's not wearing foundation. <laughs> and that's all it is. And she thought she, thought she looked all right. But now, thanks to you, she knows that she looks like shit. <laughs> That's the morning that Jan read an article in Grazia magazine that said, you don't need makeup to feel beautiful. You do not need to adhere to the fickle standards of the UK cosmetics industry. You are beautiful inside and out. You are enough. 
And Jan read that, and for the first time in her life, she believed it. And it sank into her overly moisturized skin. And she wore it, and she went into work with it, and she thought, I'm going to do it. For the first time, I'm going to go into work not wearing makeup, and I'm going to feel proud, and I'm going to feel good about myself. And she did, and she went into work up in that lift with the confidence of those women on the boots advert wearing sequins at Christmas. You know the ones I mean. Here come the girls, those ones. That was Jan. She was all buoyed up, and the lift doors opened, and she walked into the office, and you went, You're right, Jan, you look knackered. I hope you're proud. (laughs) So I think Gen Z have had a really rough time. Um, COVID was so awful for them. The school situation, Gavin Williamson cocking up with the mutant algorithm, all of that. You know that? The mutant algorithm. Gavin Williamson fucking up the exams for that generation. I feel very protective of my stepkids about that. It really messed up so many young people. Gavin Williamson, the worst thing to happen in education, well, I don't know. It was just, it was so awful. His own, his own people, senior conservatives, described that whole affair as a total shambles and described him, Sir Gavin Williamson, as a wholly unsuitable man. <laughs> Which sounds like a play by Oscar Wilde. <laughs> no, not a wholly unsuitable minister, a wholly unsuitable man. He's unsuited to even existing. <laughs> So they've had a rough ride. Um, I want to I end my little bit on a song, which was, uh, I was asked to go back to my old school, uh, which was a girls' school, and to give a, a talk uh, to these young teenage girls about what to, what to do in life and all that kind of thing. I haven't got any advice to offer them. Uh, God knows, I don't know what to do, and the world is very difficult at the moment. The best I could do for them was write them this song, um, and I'd like to sing it for you now. I hope you enjoy it. Can you believe it? 
if they let us in. I'm gonna do everything I can in the next 10 minutes to get us kicked out. <laughs> Um, hey, uh, I'm Kima, um, and uh, from America, which is a bad place, don't go. Uh, unless you're hungry, then get a meal that's too big. <laughs> you do it, I believe in you. Oh, I love this nation, I'm having a great time. So many beautiful things happening here, right? Like the lady on TV telling us to put the aluminum behind the radiator. <laughs> Just fun cultural things that you guys have, I think, are so cool. Pasties. I just love it. I'm a huge fan. Um, I've actually learned a lot since I've moved to this country. There's so many things that I didn't know when I was living in America. I'm mostly words. You guys are big on vocab. Oh, you love a long word with multiple syllables, don't you? Oh my God, it's really changed my life being here. I've learned really shiny, fancy words like austerity. <laughs> it's a nice one. It's big. It's a mouthful. <laughs> it's weird. When I initially heard the word austerity, I just thought to myself, "Ooh, sounds expensive. <laughs> Doesn't it? It sounds shiny. Austerity. <laughs> Pearls, lace, chandelier. Austerity. <laughs> like, to me, austerity sounds like something people would do on a night out in Bridgerton, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, join me tonight at my manor where we'll have a few rounds of austerity. <laughs> and then, and only then, may you fuck my son. <laughs> oh, I enjoy saying fuck my son too much. That's very fun for me. Uh, um, I have learned what austerity is. Turns out I have had it. We've all had a bit. And that's fun that we have things in common. I think it's a positive way to look at it. Um, another word that I've learned um, that I didn't know before I moved to this beautiful country uh, was referendum. <laughs> it's a big word. Another mouthful, kind of a mindful, you know? But not really a mindful decision. <laughs> it seems. <laughs> so awkward. Um, because I didn't know what a referendum was, I, of course, had no idea what a referendum could do. And it seems like you guys as a nation didn't know either. <laughs> Which is fun. I think, I think it's fun to have things in common. <laughs> uh, speaking of common, um, <laughs> there is um, one term that like, I still don't really get, uh, that I still really haven't been able to wrap my simple little American head around. Um, it's, it's commonwealth. <laughs> It's a weird one, isn't it? Because, um, like, is the wealth common in the commonwealth? No, right? Like, it seems like the wealth used to be more common. But then somebody went and grabbed it. Like a cheeky reverse Santa. And that's fun. That's silly. You guys are a fun nation. Um, <laughs> Like, what do they say? They're like, finders, keepers, losers, colonized. I think it's like how the, how the thing goes. It's something like that. I don't remember. I don't know. It's wild. I guess what gets me about the, like, commonwealth thing um, is it just feels like the wealth isn't common within the United Kingdom. And I'm just like, well, Where's the wealth at? <laughs> you know? What's so common about this commonwealth? And what gets me about it is like to go and like, you know, colonize and enslave and to take the resources of all these nations, but then have poverty within your own borders. <laughs> it's just embarrassing, no? <laughs> it just it feels like someone has mismanaged the account. <laughs> yeah? Like the math is not mathing. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> that was my calculator. Um, 
it's just weird, I don't know. And if I was like a white British person, oh, I'd be so upset. I would, I'd be, I'd be fuming. <laughs> because like, uh, you know, people are calling me a colonizer. I have all this white guilt, but I don't get the money. <laughs> Where's my white guilt money? <laughs> I'd be so mad. I just don't know why people aren't like lamezing and like revolutioning or whatever. I haven't seen the movie. I don't know what they do. One day more. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, but I just don't know why you guys aren't doing like a revolution or something. Because like we know who has the money, right? It's the Castle family. <laughs> And I just, I don't know, I, I, you know, I just don't know why you guys are more upset that they're spending all your white guilt money on, like, pedophilia. <laughs> so, so I was just making sure, oh, I feel like I said something wrong, wasn't it? It's because cause cause here you guys say pedophilia. <laughs> is what it is, and I just don't want to disrespect your culture because <laughs> it seems to mean a lot to you. <laughs> so silly. It's silly times though. I feel like the Castle family spends a lot of money. Like we saw the very shiny fune. <laughs> right? And the coronation is going to be even bigger. And like, we're in a cost of living. I'm, I'm trying to make the cost of living crisis sound cute. <laughs> like I'm trying to like yassify the cost of living crisis. <laughs> like we did it with pandemic, we made it sound less scary. We're like the pandemic, the panorama. <laughs> it's a little harder with the cost of living crisis. I'm like, we're in a COLC girl. <laughs> we're in a cult. <laughs> like would you even be thinking about that if we weren't in a cult? <laughs> Look at you wearing three sweaters inside of your house, cult. <laughs> you know what I mean? Ugh. It's tough. It's hard to make it cute because the word crisis has cry in it. <laughs> and must have like crisis at its best. Sounds like you're inviting your beloved femme friend to shed one. Just like, come on and cry, sis. <laughs> it's not good. Okay, um, oh, oh, I'm running out of time, and oh, um, oh, oh, I want to tell you a tale. Oh, I'm having so much fun. Oh, oh, okay, sorry, I'm trying to think of a, a way out of this. Oh, sorry, I just keep bouncing back and forth. It's not helpful. It's not helping me. I'm out of breath now from the movement. I don't exercise. <sighs> okay, I'm going to leave you with... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to leave you with an appreciation for being in this country um, and how much uh, I like it. I appreciate the NHS a lot. Um, I feel like... I'm sorry, is she in the house tonight? Uh, <laughs> I do, I appreciate it, because I feel like I wouldn't be able to be a professional comedian without it. Like, I cannot afford health insurance. Oh, I love the NHS so much. I really appreciate her, especially as someone with like mental health issues. But like, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but I um, identify as a <laughs> Pisces Sun Cancer Moon. <laughs> like, and I feel like the doctor didn't see that. <laughs> But I appreciate the NHS loads because before I moved to this country, um, I wanted to do all my like medical checkups, right? And I thought I had like a little lump in my boob because you know they're always like fill your boobs, and they're like uh, I think if you have male uh, genitals, they're like grab your nuts, uh, whatever. But they always want us to touch ourselves medically, and they're always like fill your boobs, and if you feel something, say something, right? So I did, um, and I went to the doctor in America, and they're like we have two options: one ultrasound, right? But you have to have one appointment today and then one appointment in six weeks. And I was like, bitch, I'm leaving the country next week. Can't do. Um, and they were like, option two is a biopsy where we have to go in, boop, boop, and we get the little, we get a little piece of you. We grab a little, little piece of your soul. Boop, boop, grab it, test it. And then we can tell you the results almost instantly. And I was like, that's the option. So we do it, right? We sit me down for the procedure, one tit out, which felt imbalanced, but they were only... 
gonna poop boop into one of them. They go and boop boop, take it out, give me the test, give me the test results. Your girl was cancer free. <laughs> which was sick, but with my test results, they did also send me a bill, <laughs> uh, which they told me that they were charging me 1,400 doll hairs for the boop boop. And all I have to say is y'all better be grateful for the NHS because for $1,400, I wanted them to go back in there and find something. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not gonna say, oh, we went in there, took out a piece of your meat and there was nothing special. Like, get back in there, find some, like, find the cause of my loneliness. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, go back, dig around. Oh, anyway, um, I think came about, we've been great, thank you. Bob, so um, there's not much show left, which you'll be both sad and happy to know. Um, sad because that's, we obviously want more show, uh, but happy because there's no uh, known way of knowing if there's any transport when we leave. Like, we just, <laughs> we don't know, we don't know. Will there be trains? We don't know. Will Ubers be available or taxis, black girl and cat? We don't know. It's absolutely not clear how many of us are getting home. That's why we need to leave at a reasonable hour. Otherwise, we would simply lock the doors and party the night away. Um, the good news is, the good news is there are more shows. There's three more shows before the end of the year at King's Place in London. Uh, please book for those. Don't just book for the big fancy ones because those are where we get deep down. The first one we're talking about internet security for women it's, and, and people of minority gender. So you've got to come along to that one. Uh, but there's some, we've got some incredible guests, so please book for our King's Play shows, which are October, November, December. And also, on the 3rd of December, we're at the South Bank Centre with The Guilty Feminist Presents uh, Camp as Christmas. Um, uh, I'm co-hosting with Tom Allen. We've got some incredible comedians on the bill. Rosie Jones, Susie Ruffle, Kima Bob, uh, Larry Dean. And all the proceeds, all our proceeds from that go to the Say It Loud Club run for and by LGBTQ plus refugees fleeing homophobic oppression. So uh, you, you're going to want to be at that. We're also going to have some. We're going to have some refugees on the stage. We're going to have a comedy auction. Uh, last time we did Campus Christmas, uh, we auctioned off uh, things May Martin had touched um, and uh, all sorts. So uh, you don't want to miss it. Um, Russell Tovey's going to be there. It's going to be incredible. There are also some guests that I'm not allowed to say yet. Now. But you, one thing you know is they're not, they're, they're not straight. Um, <laughs> it's an LGBTQ plus bill. Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. We have three recordings live coming up at King's Place in London, the 24th of October, the 21st of November, and the 14th of December. And tickets will be on sale soon for The Guilty Feminist Presents Campus Christmas on Saturday the 3rd of December. It'll be an incredible lineup featuring me and Tom Allen hosting, Rosie Jones, Larry Dean, Kima, Bob, Susie Ruffle, Sophie Duca, and Rob Diamond and Russell Tovey from Talk Art, plus some incredible music and other acts. It will be camp, it will be fabulous, and all proceeds will go to the Say It Loud Club, run for and by... LGBTQ plus refugees fleeing homophobic oppression. For more information about all these shows and to book tickets, which you want to do right now, go to guiltyfeminist.com. And why not support the show and get ad-free episodes by going to patreon.com forward slash guilty feminist. If you would like to support the show in another way, go and rate, review and subscribe or follow friend, whatever the podcast, it helps other people find it. And now, back to the podcast. Uh, all right, are we ready for our fabulous panel? <laughs> so in seven years, so I wanted to sit with my girls. I didn't want to go into a deep dive conversation about something. I want to sit with my gals and talk about what we've learned from the last seven years. So please welcome back to the stage, Desiree Birch, Rachel Paris, Kima Bob, and Grace Petrie. <laughs> Hello. Oh, hello. I, 
love you all so much. And it's such an honor for me to have you here on stage uh, with us. I, we, we're, we need to say we're so sorry that both Sindhu V and Jessica Kostuki couldn't make it because uh, of illness and family issues, but they both sent their love and they're so sad they couldn't be here. But uh, I think you'll agree that it has been an incredible night anyway, and it would have been too long if they'd come. <laughs> very sad. We're very sad they couldn't come, though. Um, so thank you so much for coming. I'm going to start with you, Desiree. Because I'm in the starter position. <laughs> it's, and we all know I'm a starter. Yeah, you are, you, you're wearing a fluorescent, like, hot girl summer outfit uh -huh. on the first of October. I mean, I missed summer. So if anyone wants pills or glow sticks, I got you. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> I, that sounds like a joke. It isn't. Um, <laughs> We will be taking All you up on that stage, later. All backstage, backstage, pills, glow sticks, pills, glow sticks, like Desiree, we came to do comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Stop trying to sell me your glow sticks. But soon, you know, soon, soon. Um, Desiree, is there a moment since, so we started this end of 2015, and it really, I think, kicked off January 2016. Yeah. What's something from the last seven years that's a, mem a feminist memory for you? Okay. Sorry, you know, it, like the longer I wait, the funnier it needs to be and it's not gonna go that way. Um, I just, just wanna take it right down. Um, okay, what I wanna talk about, there's a thing that I could talk about. This isn't necessarily feminist directly, but I feel like all of these movements are bleeding into one, which is what I think needs to happen. Yes. Um, yes, and so I feel like, like as horrific as uh, you know, 2020 and everything that it begat was, one of the things that is happening now, like everybody in America is talking about quiet quitting, which is literally just doing the bare minimum of your job, which is what we all should have been doing because none of us was getting paid enough to do as much shit as we were doing, invisible labor included. And so, yes, and so what I love is that people are like, actually, I'm not putting on anything with a zipper and buttons anymore. I'm going to wear sweats one day a week to your establishment, and I will do the rest of the work in my pajamas at home, and I will clock out at five o'clock on the dot because we can't just sort of be operating on a policy of extraction. It's gone on for too many centuries, and... It's time that you get only what you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would say that's true in, unless you're in the top tax bracket, but the top tax bracket is now no tax, apparently. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's the wrong way around. Yes. I, well, specifically for them, but I, what I love is that all of us are getting madder. Yeah. And we on, you, you only stop digging, like, you only hit rock bottom when you stop digging. Right? Yeah. And we're getting to the place where everybody is kind of going, this is insane, right? And I feel like we're only a couple years off from eating the rich. Do you know, like... From having like, to. Yes, yes, from having to. But the movements are starting to bleed, and that is what has been needing to happen for quite some time. I 100% think we need to start aligning more and stop sniping at each other for hours on Twitter over minute things and get together and organize and unionize and rally. Um, now I will say none of the comedians tonight uh, were quiet quitters uh, because none of them stayed to their time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which leads me into Kima Bob. Kima Bob, what was your uh, memory of the last seven years that you'd like to share? Yeah. Well, sorry, this is weird because I'm just so shy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> This podcast has been really beautiful for me, and being a part of like this, like larger family in this community has been really nice and really inspiring. And um, I think for me, getting to know you, um, you've really helped me to kind of. I always knew how I felt. I always had like feminist instincts, you know. But I wasn't reading things about it. I was just like, I know how I feel, I know this is just fucked up. Um, and it's been lovely, it's, it's been more than one moment, but being able to be on this journey with you and learning more and meeting like incredible people that are making things happen um, has shown me that like we can make change. And that's been really cool, so like, thanks, Thank you. I'm gonna say that. 
thought you were going to say like a women's march or something. That's really, I'm, I'm really moved by it, but I will no, say... No, it was probably Stone doing the women's march. <laughs> um, but I'm glad that some of you guys went out um, on our behalf. <laughs> um, I should say on this that we've now got the House of the Guilty Feminist, um, which someone said to me today is quite drag of us. Uh, they were like, that, you know, that's a drag thing. I was yeah. like, I was like, kind of, but that wasn't what I was thinking, but now I love that. Um, and... Uh, Kima's podcast is, and the live show is, is one of the first of those. It's called Femmes of Color, uh, uh, or for short, Fuck It Up. And FSC for Fuck It Up. And please, can I ask you all to, to subscribe tonight? Because it's really, really helpful. It's a very crowd. When the Guilty Femmes started, it wasn't such a crowded marketplace. There was like, ask no such thing as a fish. Richard Herring, that was it. That was all you had to listen to. There were three shows, and then... All of these like big guys that own four million pounds of Netflix specials started making their own podcasts and crowding up the market, and I resent them. But <laughs> so if you could listen to Fuck It Up, also Media Storm, which is another one of ours, and it's uh, Helena Wadia, Matilda Malnison, and they are seriously investigating stuff. They're giving voice to the voiceless. They're incredible. They've been their first season. They've won three awards. They won the Br- British Podcasting Award for Current Affairs over The Economist, The Guardian, The BBC, and everyone, because they are acting like they've got the budget of Panorama. In fact, that I know that they don't, because I pay them. Yeah, they get so um, deep into it. Yeah. I feel like it's like the um, uh, stuff that you do on the podcast that's like getting deep into like issues and serious. Like, I feel like that's like a seed, and they've like grown and sprouted 100%. a giant tree, and then we've just taken the comedy bit and the guilt. I think that's right. You've taken the comedy side, but also what you're doing is so important because it's femmes of color. So you're taking, you're making these opportunities for, for women and uh, people of minority well, genders of color, and it's incredible. Just creating space to vibe like this, yes, which is yeah. an opportunity that we don't often have. But if you don't listen to them, or at least subscribe to them, you don't even have to listen, just subscribe. <laughs> it's gonna make a big difference. I would prefer you did listen. Subscribe. But at least fucking subscribe. Please just do us that favor because we're really trying to do something here and we're just spending money on it to, because we believe in it and we believe in you. So if you could get on board with it and tell other people in your WhatsApp groups. I mean, Twitter now. Oh, so it's good. Like, it's yeah, actually it's really so good. so fucking good. Both, really of good. These, both of these notes are so fucking good. Femmes of Color hasn't had time to win any awards yet. We've only just started it. But Media Storm have won fucking everything they've entered. So please, please listen to both of them. They're really good. And attend the live show as well for Femmes of Color. It's dope. It's amazing. Wait a second. Before you move forward, can we just go back to House of Guilty Feminist? Yeah. Like, you are the mother of the House of the Guilty Feminist. <laughs> Which is amazing. I'm going to get a bigger ring. Yes, and yeah. I love you and you are wonderful, but I want you to become insufferable. I want you to be like, you can never be part of the House of the Gibson Feminists. Look at my objectify me nails. Look at my cape. I, I, I am like, not... You're already wearing capes. It feels like you need that really big Disney collar. Uh, I have got one cape with that Disney collar, yeah, to be honest. Yeah. I've got one with a Disney cape. A pig as well. I yeah, I mean, it's, it's inevitable. I'm going to age into it. I don't think Tom Selinski and Gina DCO really want me to become more insufferable, honestly. I don't think they're like, wow, Deb. And Rachel Craftsman, who books the guest, who's amazing. I don't think any of them, Stuart, who's been, who tours us, he's an incredible person, and he's just the best tour manager. I don't think any of them are going, more insufferable, please. Uh, that's my guess. Grace Petrie, you've toured with me. Should I be more insufferable? <laughs> You could give so much more to being insufferable. <laughs> uh, I'd love touring with you. Yeah, um, is that the question? I mean, the question is memories, but I was just doing a segue. Memories. <laughs> no, memories. I've, I've loved all the tours. I've loved all the shows. And I agree with Kima, man. Just like, same. It's such an empowering space here. And I feel... No, like... you don't get to have my answer. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Yeah, it's such an empowering <laughs> space, isn't it? We never tear each other down. Fuck you, yeah. <laughs> No sharing in feminism. Um, You're on your but, own. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, fuck it up. Um, I, for me, like I think uh, around the repeal the eighth uh, referendum in Ireland, I, uh, there was uh, yeah, there was so much uh, on Twitter that day. So many um, Irish women were tweeting that they were flying home. Irish women who didn't live in Ireland at the time, they were flying home to vote. And I remember just I had a show that day, and I remember just like re-scrolling the Twitter hashtag and just like crying my eyes out about the power of that. And I think. You know, the, being a part of the show and a part of the community of the Guilty Feminists, it's, you know, to copy your answer again, I think it's like 
really connecting like what we're doing to the wider political context and I think that is really good because we can all feel so alone in our little bubbles and also finally I am just thrilled that so many of the original cast of the Guilty Feminist have become queer over the time that we've been doing this. <laughs> we are trumping really up with pride. To do. We are trumping up with I've never thought of that before, Grace, but everyone who goes I on think about it a lot. <laughs> I was straight I when I met Grace Petrie and I just felt myself morphing. It was like a Power Ranger situation. <laughs> Jess Foster Q, there was a whole bunch of us went on tour with you straight and came what back. What happens on tour stays on tour, that's all. <laughs> came back, bye. Can I just say, I swear you just said that and just sort of turned to me, like you're the only one left. Yeah. <laughs> you are, you are the, uh, might be the only straight woman on this panel, but listen, there's time, the night is young. Yeah. I don't call myself straight. Like, oh! I think, I think. That happened the, fast. The grace, <laughs> the grace effect working <laughs> really fast. I didn't want to assume, I thought that's no, what you I were take saying. That back, I don't want to take away from properly people coming out and stuff, but I just, I just think that everyone has a tendency to be bi, and I think that seems like a more natural resting state. Um, so I agree, I agree. I've only said that because I thought that's what you were saying. I, I, yeah, I yeah. 100% don't really believe in straight people. <laughs> yeah. I think... I think 10% of people are gay, oh and 10% of people are straight, and 80% of people... And in the right circumstances, which is on tour with Grace Petrie, will <laughs> turn. <laughs> will turn. Rachel, any moments for the last seven years? I guess it was coming out at the <laughs> No. Uh, I, um, I've been struggling because everyone has said really huge political things and also copied yours, uh, Kim. Um, the only, uh, the only thing I think, the, the, the one I thought of was related to how you introduced me, um, which, uh, this is going to sound conceited, but it's the opposite, if you wait, um, <laughs> is uh, the, the first uh, female host of a late night satirical show. And when I got asked to do a statement about starting to host this show, I attempted to write something like that about, I'm very proud and honoured to be the first uh, woman hosting a uh, the, the first regular host of, of a, on television late night satirical show and there were so many qualifiers for that they sent it back and they said I don't think we can say any of this and I thought what a fantastic thing that is yeah. that I can't just say that that actually there are so many more women appearing in entertainment representing that uh, you that that is such a heavily qualified statement that it's sort of lost all meaning. <laughs> but still, and I'm glad it it's should still be. a big deal. I, it is, and but it's I'm a... glad there's Sandy Toxvig. I'm glad there's Steph McGovern. Of course. I'm glad there's Angela Barnes. I'm glad there's all those people who. Of course. Yeah. And I am too. But I. But it is still a big deal. And I don't want to. Like I feel like a man wouldn't have said that. He would have just said, "I'm thrilled to be the first blah blah blah." And the only. Oh, yes. yes. First the only. It's and to me. It was like um, I remember John Oliver once saying about something like this. Um, it's like hearing a ten-year-old is weaned. Unequivocally good news, but can't hopefully it should have happened a lot earlier. And that's what I felt about it. But I'm I'm so thrilled you're doing such great work. And for me, the memories here have been incredible. The first time I saw Kima Bob do stand up. Um, the first time I saw Grace Petrie sing Black Tie Tonight, which was the first time you'd sung it in public. And Rachel and I were co-hosting, and we I was crying like a child. I, I felt so embarrassed because I'm sitting on the stage behind you crying. And I looked to the left, trying to get myself together, and Rachel was just in bits. <laughs> and I was like, up. and the audience gave a 15-minute standing ovation because we all felt it was the first time. You know, we felt it. And we had to call an interval because there was no coming back from it. And I think... It's the same thing tonight. We always put her on before the interval because otherwise there's no going back, you know. And I just think, and, and you know, getting to know Desiree, the wisdom of you, you know, is been incredible. And all of the other women, I've got to say, Felicity Ward, Alison Spittle, women, you know, uh, Susan McComa, you know, I'm missing out people I know who have taught me so much and come on this journey with, it's us. It's, it, this is, this is I, I never feel I'm at the head of this, I'm at the heart of this. And I feel so privileged and tonight you have been the finest audience of your generation um, thank you for listening thank you for downloading thanks for telling other people thanks for bringing people thanks for bringing people from vienna thanks for every single one of you it's it means the world to me and this space is very sacred and i am honored absolutely honored by all of you all of the time and all of you so thank you um, thank you thanks for like creating this 
space, facilitating this space, taking us on this journey. Like, I don't think I'd be like a professional comedian if I didn't have this place to be in. And I really appreciate it. Well, <laughs> Kima, that would be a great loss to the world because you tore it up tonight. And what you're saying is so important. And just your presence is so fucking important right now. You know, Roe versus Wade being overturned was horrendous. There's a lot of horrendous other things that are going on in the world right now. But do you know what the news is? They have never seen women sign up to vote in these numbers. The second women are turning 18, they are going down and they are signing up to vote and they are saying it so they can vote Democrat. And we need your voice. And we need what you're doing, which is taking that next generation of young femmes of color and platforming them. You, to me, are the uh, Gen Z Oprah. And we need you, baby. I'm the feminist bit of a millennial and I really enjoyed being called Gen, Gen Z. Z. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you've got a Gen Z energy. Like, I've, I'm Gen X, but I've got a Gen, I've got a Gen Y energy. I've been you know. watching Euphoria. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gen X with a Gen Z rising. Um, listen, we've got to bring on our final absolutely incredible act. She is absolutely one of my favorites. Could you put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for the wonderful Jess Robinson? <laughs> Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me in the Guilty Feminist family. I bloody love it. I've learned such a lot and I'm still as guilty as ever, but I'm trying, so that's good. I've got a little treat for you. And that little treat is called Grace Petrie. <laughs> well, lovely humans, um, we are about to do a really groundbreaking duet. <laughs> We'll break some ground for sure. We are. Uh, it's quite a radical song. I don't know if any of you will know it. It's, I think it's sort of a, a, a holy feminist text, I would yes. say. Yes, very um, holy. Quite ahead of its time, I, I would think. I'd say so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. strap in. Strap the fuck in. Mm. <laughs> We've practiced this upwards of one time. Yeah. <laughs> Now there was a time when they used to say <laughs> behind every great man there had to be a great woman. Times have changed, and much is true. Don't you know a man's delight? 
Absolutely wonderful. Can we have a huge round of applause for a whole incredible cast? <laughs> Rachel, Kima, Desiree, and Peter, Claudia, Jess, Grace, and Clemmy. <laughs> Take us away. I've been on so many nights 
been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Debbie Francis White, and my very special guests, Claudia Kariuki, Desiree Birch, and Kita Saxena, Grace Petrie, Rachel Paris, Kima Bob, Clem Arnold, and Jess Robertson. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge, produced by Nick Sheldon, the producer was Tom Selitsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Rachel Craftman, Gina Dizio, Stuart Arnold, Bjorn and Jody, and everyone at Show and Tell and ACAST, and everyone at the Hammersmith Event in Apollo, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Yes? Yes? Yes. Um, I'm, t- I'm talking to people in the wings, but some of them are... Um, Lady First the Musical. Okay, you, you really are a feminist, aren't you? You're plugging someone else's musical. Just to, it's, so it's called Lady First. This microphone isn't reliable, is it? This, is, <laughs> this microphone isn't as reliable as we'd want it to be. This is like the equipment we have to do with feminism with all the time. It works sometimes, it's a bit on and off, but it's all we've got and we make do. Very, very like every other part of feminism. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.